know as we started praise and worship this morning, it's always my custom to first make sure that the Lord's here and just make sure he's invited. And as I was inviting him, it was like he was standing right here and said, I'm already here. I love that. We're on part four this morning of a kingdom paradigm of reality. And I'm going to be touching again on some things regarding strongholds. There are some things God is wanting to move us on to. How many are ready to move on to some things, to some better things? But unless we really get this and we get some of the premise, because how many know there are a lot of ways of viewing things that the earth tries to put into the church and has bedded into the church and has embedded in Western culture that has really handicapped us? And unless we can change our paradigm, there needs to be a shift in the way we see things. There needs to be a shift in the way that we understand things. There needs to be a shift in the way that we understand how the universe works. If we don't, we can't move on in God. There's some things that God's wanting to establish. There's some things that uh, I'm tired of wandering in the wilderness. I'm ready to get onto the promised land. There are some ites that I want to womp. You know what I mean? I, I am tired of walking around in circles. In my Christian walk, there are some things I want to go on to. And to do that, I've got to have a new paradigm. I've got to have a paradigm of crossing over the Jordan and getting some things done in God's promised land. And I really think that's, that's one of the things that God is trying to do with, with the last series being established in truth and now in this one. If we, if we can get established in our way of seeing things from his perspective of how he created things to function, then we can go on. It'll be a time for us to cross over Jordan. I want to go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Now, we've already discovered how that when God made man, he made him as a tripartite being. He's spirit, soul, and body, and he's to function in all three. We see here, and when the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so we, we see a state of, of chaos. There's something that happened between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. And I've taught on this quite a bit. But that's not really what I want us to show, show us, is here we had the physical world in chaos. And really all the world was underwater at that time because you see later on in the creation process, God causes dry ground to come up. So when the Holy Spirit is over the face of the water, he's over all the face of the material world waiting for something to happen. And the, the word ruach in the Hebrew, it's literally, he was the breath of God waiting for the words of God to impact this physical universe. That if God had not moved from the spirit into the physical realm, none of the rest of Genesis would have happened. And when you look at the principle of first mention, we learn that the only way to truly change the physical universe, it has to first start with a spiritual power. Oh. Light should be coming on right now because... Anything done in the earth that affects the way men think, thinks what men do or what men say, has to have a spiritual force behind it. There is no such thing as not having a spiritual force behind anything done in the earth. Whether it is an economy, whether it is a, a political movement, or revolution, or whatever you want to call it, how many know there was a spirit behind the Occupy movement? And it began to show up its filth as it went along to the place that for public, that they begin to have outbreaks of plagues, if you will, begin to break out in that because it was manifesting what it was. That there was a spiritual power empowering that thing that caused, that were trying to cause changes. If we don't understand that, we are never going to change our world. If we don't understand that, you're never going to change your life. Because you've got to stop and look to see what's speaking into your situation. Well, how do you look at it? You look at the fruit of it. 
There are a lot of believers today that say they're walking with God, but their fruit is all the wrong fruit. It's stamped with the other kingdom on it, yet they say constantly, I'm, I'm following God. Hmm? Jesus said, by their fruit you would know them, not by their denomination, not by, and here's one for you, not by whether they meet on Sunday or meet on Saturday. How many of us have seen a lot of Saturday-going folk that their life is all kinds of full of the wrong fruit? Just as much as many of the Sunday-going people. And many of the Sunday-going people, a lot of them have better fruit than some of the fruit of those who keep the Sabbath. It's not just keeping the feast. It's, it's not just going through the motions. There's something more involved here. But what you need to remember is everything in your life, everything that you do, from your marriage to your work to what you buy, has a spiritual component, has a, phys- has a, has a component of your soul, the will, the mind, the emotions, and a physical one. If you, if you don't put that into the equation, you let the enemy sneak up on you. And I'm tired of that sneak. There is a tripartite nature to every stronghold in your life. Now look at this. For though we walk in the flesh or we walk in the physical world, we do not war after the physical world, after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so he's talking about the power of God. The power of God always starts where? In the spirit realm. Just like when God spoke, he spoke out of nothing and created something. He spoke out of the spirit realm and he created this physical realm. So the weapons of my warfare are spiritual. It's got to start with the spirit. I can't. There are a lot of times I wish I could grab a hold of the devil physically and just wring his little stupid neck. But there aren't hands big enough or hands anointed enough to do that. You've got to start with God speaking to you, with, that, with the Spirit of God empowering you. For the, our weapons of our warfare are not, are not carnal. They're, they're not physical. But they are mighty through God. That word mighty there in the Greek means the ability to do anything, to accomplish whatever God speaks it to be. But look what happens. Okay, I start in the spirit. I'm coming against a stronghold. Now it's causing me to cast down vain, ima- uh, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It starts in the spirit, but it has its effect in the soul. Now, let's look here again at this diagram. Everything that begins in your life, whether it's of God or the devil, starts with the Spirit. What's a stronghold? It's a place where a demonic spirit or a spiritual force not of God has embedded itself into your life and it speaks to you. And it affects your will, your mind, and your emotions. It goes from here, it goes from the Spirit, and it begins to affect your soul with ideas with feelings, with emotions that try to get you to do something physically because if it can speak and make you think and make you act, it releases its power into your life. Salah. Think about that for a minute. Just like when the Holy Ghost is trying to get you to do something, he's speaking to you, and, he, and you start getting to think his way, and when you start thinking his way and doing what he says, the power of God is released in your life. It, Satan can't devise a new engineering system to change reality around you. He has to use the one that God established in Genesis 1. And because we don't know it, he uses it against us. If he can have one of his agents speak spiritually to us and we start thinking its way and feeling its thoughts and begin doing its actions, it releases the power of the kingdom of darkness to do something in your life. That's the purpose of a stronghold. Now, we had discussed in in Lesson 2 on Established in Truth that many of our strongholds, our thoughts where this thing is inhabiting, is in our unconscious mind. And so God lets the situations of life come up to, to, to trigger, if you will, 
this wrong idea, this wrong voice that's speaking so that the Spirit of God can say, right there, change that. Anybody ever been there? All of a sudden, you start thinking the wrong stuff and you start feeling the wrong stuff and you're about ready to have a flesh out. And the Spirit of God says, hold on there, big boy. You don't want all that flesh moving in that direction. What's he doing? He's helping you come against a stronghold. Now, what will happen when Christians don't realize this, because I've seen this happen in churches forever. Somebody, their, their stronghold, where that demonic spirit is there, saying, you know what, you need to get mad at sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, or, or they didn't do this, or they didn't shake your hand during church or whatever. I, I've, I've seen church splits over old broken-down pews. I mean, some of the stupidest stuff. And the world looks at you and say, are you nuts? I used to have friends in the military tell me, all the weird people go to church. No. (laughs) Sometimes. But I've seen a lot of weirdness in people who don't go to church. I mean, they put the big capital W in weird, okay? But they'll, they'll get this little thing going, and it'll start affecting the way they feel about somebody. It doesn't matter if those people would have brought them gold bricks. They'd have found something wrong with it. Well, I know. I tell you what, Sister Susie, there's something she's up to. now. She's just too nice to me. Come on. It doesn't matter what you've done. And they say, she's just going to wrong me. I I can feel it. And it ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy because as you speak it out, as you think on it, you're releasing that demonic power in your life to bring it to pass. And what it does is it entrenches the power of that spirit into your life. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, guys. And the only way to overcome this force is with a greater spiritual force, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. One is the spirit of error trying to take you into more error. And how many of us have seen churches that were doctrinally all correct, but everything else in the church was an error? All the family's lives were an error. And all of a sudden, and it could get so bad it can loose a generational curse. As you say, well, I cannot believe in curses. Have you looked at some people's lives here lately? Not just in the world, but in the churches. One bad thing after another, after another, after another. And it's, it's not just because so-and-so just bowed their knee at a Masonic altar or whatever. It's because that spirit was embedded in that family and that spirit is still speaking. And as long as that spirit is still speaking, it changes how they think, feel, and perceive the world around them. And they get to doing stupid stuff. And it ends up being a curse. That's why the only way to reverse a curse is more than just a prayer asking God to forgive you of generational sins of the past. It's God's got to change who you're listening to so that he can change how you're thinking and you respond to your universe so that God can release his power for the first time in what you do. If you don't change that, you're not going to change anything. And what that spirit will do is he will set you up for defeat time and time and time again. And he'll get you to blame God over it. Well, you know, God's word just don't work. Well, you weren't listening to him. You weren't thinking what he said. You sure weren't doing what he did. You just put a facade on, and you're bearing the fruit of another spirit and then trying to blame God. Time to stop and start looking at what is really pushing my buttons. Every situation we go through in life, and I I, I have woken up to this fact that every time I have a situation... Nobody, does anybody but preachers have situations? We got a situation going on today. Every situation is a chance to, to allow God to bring up a stronghold that I need to overcome. And when I overcome it, it's out of my life. I have identified the enemy. I have identified that voice. One of the problems with believers trying to hear the voice of God, this little critter up here in the spirit in these old strongholds, they, they, if you get saved, they try to pretend the voice of God. And they will get you to keep the commandments by another spirit. How many know there's truth in, in, in eating kosher root? But how many know that you can make that so offensive by the way that you do it, you end up being God's kosher police and a Torah terrorist, that you turn everybody off around you over it. 
and you make the very things of God offensive by having a religious spirit trying to empower the word of God and it produces another fruit. Seen that a lot. Had sometimes the truth of God presented to me so offensively, my first, my first reaction was, ain't this fat boy doing that? No way. <laughs> Nuh-uh. Then I go back in the Word and I say, okay, it was the truth, but it was laced with the power of another spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to bring new life, life lessons to your life to overcome the squatters in your promised land. You see, while you were in Egypt under Pharaoh, the enemy came in to all your promised land. How many know that you have spiritual territory in your life? You also have territory within your soul. And many of us have a lot of territory in our bodies. In fact, some of us are having a hard time finding stuff big enough to go around some of our territories, okay? But we, we, have, we have territory just like if I could take my body mass, there's, there's room for a lot of things that I could fit in there, you know. There's a lot of room, there's t- room for two or three cheeseburgers, a whole big old thing of fries. and in your, in your soul, there's room for lots of stuff. In your spirit, there's room for lots of stuff. And while you were lost, the enemy filled it in with his influence, his lies, and the ways that he wanted you to live. Because you got saved doesn't mean all that's gone. It now means that you, the Holy Spirit's moving in. Your spirit got saved the moment that you were born again. But now you still have all these strongholds in your life. And he's saying, let me teach you how to get rid of the Jebusites and the Pezusites and all these otherites. And let them, your, your job is to use my power to push them out of your spiritual and your mental, your emotional, and your physical territory so that you can establish the kingdom of God. And God, as, as in the Torah, as he's saying that, he promises, said, listen, if you do this right, it can be the days of heaven on the earth. I don't know about you, but a lot of my life has been a far cry from days of heaven on earth. I'm thinking, you know, one of my mentors, he used to say, you know, if you're saved, this is your hell. Because after you get, after you pass on, it all, it's all uphill from there because you're going to heaven. But then he turns around and says, you know, if you're not saved, this is your heaven because it all goes downhill after you leave here. But... God says, listen, if you let me work in your life and identify where the enemy has got a stronghold in and root that thing out and stop listening to him and start listening to me and let me replace the emotions he built within you, the desires he built within you, the thought patterns he built within you so that it changes the way that you think, speak, and act, I can begin changing that area from hell to heaven. That's what God was trying to convey when he gave that promise in Torah. So when I got saved, for the first time I could hear the Spirit of God. But a lot of believers, when they, when they, after they get saved, they're hit and miss. They'll listen to the Spirit of God, then they'll listen to a stronghold. They'll listen to a Spirit of God, then they'll listen to a stronghold. They'll listen to a Spirit of God, and then they'll listen to a stronghold. If you've ever been involved in Christian counseling, it can make you pull out your hair. Because sometimes they get excited when they listen to the stronghold because the Spirit of God wants to crucify the flesh and the, and the stronghold wants to embed the flesh. And, and they say, oh, this has just got to be a God. No, it's a stronghold. And it's really hard to get them to see until you step back and say, less logically, okay, let's, let's walk this out. When you plant this seed and you cultivate this seed, and what's the harvest going to be? Oh, it's bad. That wasn't a God. Wisdom... When you grow in God, as you can step back and you can look at the seed and, and you can extrapolate out what you, the, the Holy Spirit will show you what happens if you put this thing in, into motion and you see the fruit. When, you, when, you're, when you're immature spiritually, you can't see the fruit. You can't look ahead enough in time to see the fruit. And uh, there's been a lot of things over the years that have been presented to me. And sometimes as, as, as I was maturing in the Lord, I did the wrong things. I, I thought the wrong things. I let the wrong things speak to me. But the more I'm I'm growing in God, the more I can kind of see ahead enough to say, that's too costly. That moves me away from what I already know God's called me to do. 
and it begins allowing me to pull down that stronghold. But what God's begun dealing with me about this week is that we, you have territory. You're tearing down the fortified areas of the enemy. But did you know that you can build up fortified areas for God? That you can have places in your life that God can always speak. <laughs> I want to look at a couple of things in, in the Word. Look at this in Psalms 71, 1 through 3. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline mine ear unto, thine ear unto me and save me. Be thou my strong habitation. Therefore, wherefore I may continually resort... Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my what? My fortress. We want God to be our fortress, but that fortress has got to be built within before it can be manifested without. In every area that I allow God to speak to me, and I allow him to, de to develop a domain in that area of my life, it becomes a fortified area that when God speaks, I listen because let me tell you something. I don't care if you're saved or not. This, this may be a hard pill to swallow for some believers. If you're listening to strongholds, you're listening to demonic presences. And whatever you obey is your God. That is the very definition of a God. Those that don't believe in the God of the Bible but are following after gods, who are they listening to? They're not listening to God. They're listening to another spirit. And you, you identify your God by whom you obey. And so with your lips, you can be saying, I serve Jesus all day long. But in your life, if you're listening to a stronghold, you're a pagan. You're following another God, little g. So part of the sanctification process... Come on, you knock over all the high places. You knock over all the idols. In the middle of every stronghold is a pagan idol. And it's your job. It makes a high place. Fortified area, a high place. An idol in the middle of it that's speaking to you, and you do what that idol says. And that's how a Christian can serve another god. A God of the past. A God of Egypt, if you will. And God says, let me go ahead and give you a Holy Ghost bulldozer. And I'm going to let a situation come up in your life that if you listen to me, you're going to see that thing for what it really is. And you repent and you pull it down. And you say, I'll no longer listen to that, God. I want you. And so what you do is you level that thing and you built an altar to God. And all in and, and those areas, not only do you keep the commandments of God, but God begins to command your salvation. Command to save me. Command the blessing. You see what God's wanting us to do. God is tired of us being like Jacob. He wants us to be like Israel. Jacob ran after every blessing. And how many seen Christians run after a blessing? One after another, after another, after another. You know, then the, the old cares maybe you know come come under the spout where their glory comes out. You know, and so they're running looking for spouts. You're supposed to have a, <laughs> you're supposed to have an artesian well of the Holy Ghost flowing out of you. What are you looking for somebody's faucet for? Jacob would connive. He would wrestle an angel all night long for a blessing. But when God changed his walk, he he moved from chasing after a blessing to being the blessing. Blessings manifested around him. God could command the blessing. Mm. That's going to hit you in a minute. God is longing to help you raise, R-A-Z-E, everything of the enemy in your life. He's, he's wanting you to tear down all the high places, to kosher those things, to knock over every idol that has been speaking to you all your life. Even and after you got saved, trying to tell you that it was God and it wasn't. And you look at it by the fruit in your life. Can I say this the way that people would say it today? If areas in your life suck, it's because you've been listening to the wrong spirit. If it stinks like fish on ice, the Holy Ghost did not tell you to do it. The Holy Ghost did not move you that way. 
another spirit did, and then, and then tried to tell you that it was God who did it. I don't know about you, but it's time to kick over that altar and knock it into a million pieces and say, you know what? I know what. When God does something, God blesses something. When God does it, it's good. I'm preaching this morning just a little bit, aren't I? Psalms 91, 1 through 3. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You know what that is? When you have a place in your life where you have an altar of God set up, you dwell there and you dwell under the shadow of his altar. Look what it says. And I will say unto the Lord, he is my refuge and my what? My fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He'll deliver you from what the enemy's trying to do if he is allowed to speak into that area of your life. So let me ask you something. Is it possible for God to be able to speak in one area of your life and not another? Yes. You've got to look at who's talking. You've got to spend enough time around God that you recognize his voice. And don't go by Holy Ghost goosebumps because the devil can give them to you too. Come on now. Yeah. God's my fortress. I want to build fortified areas in my life the enemy can't get in. I am tired of having areas in my life that God's on the outside knocking, trying to get in. I want the devil to be able to not even get near the place. Because Almighty God is there. And the habod of God, the glory of God, the manifested weight of his presence has taken a hold of that area. Jeremiah. O oh Lord, now we sang this one. O oh Lord, my strength, my refuge. Uh, my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things that wherein there is no profit. Now, so many times we will, we will see that quoted from Hebraic circles about our, our, our pagan holidays. But let me tell you something. You got a lot of pagan strongholds and a lot of pagan philosophies and a lot of pagan things that have a good Christian veneer on the outside, just like Christmas and Easter and all these other things do. And God is saying, listen, you can inherit their, we, we call them family spirits or familiar spirits. They'll go from generation to generation to generation because if that's the way the family thinks, there's a spirit behind the way the family thinks. And if you accept that, then it embeds itself in your life. One of the hardest places for newlyweds is to get rid of all the junk that mom and dad taught them in their households about how the life is supposed to be. Because on both sides, it stank. Especially if they're trying to walk with God and to find out, as for me in my house, I'm going to serve God. I've cut off the past. Mom and Dad, I love you, but you were wrong here, 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 and here. And if you're honest with yourself, you know it stunk like fish on ice. It was horrible. And you can tell an honest parent with a parent really under bondage because a parent under bondage will get mad at you, especially when you start getting blessed for doing the opposite of what they're doing. An honest parent will say, you know what, maybe I need to look at this. I got a real sweet email this week from one of our students. Or no, actually, it was a, was it a phone call. That was an email. I went through so much this week. <laughs> um, and got in, into our biblical life prayer dynamics where we they have to write a report on Christmas and Easter. When she found out about Christmas, uh, that was a call. Not only did she get rid of all her Christmas stuff, she showed her mom and dad and her eyes got about this big and they got rid of all theirs too. Which really helps if you don't have to fight mom and dad. Come on. <laughs> Stronghold. Anyway. Um, it really blessed me that that when mom and dad are spiritual enough to really see and to hear God and say, you know what? That may have been the way we've done all these years, but it, we really weren't getting the fruit that we wanted, and it wasn't God, and it hurt the heart of God. Psh, out with it. That's maybe, maybe you come from a heritage that will hear God and loves God. 
But how many of us have had concepts and things in our childhood, the way our families did things, that always kept them in defeat, that always kept them poor, that always kept them not having stuff, that always kept them in bad relationships, not having any real friends, whatever, you can extrapolate it out into whatever area you want. And we, when we left the household, we had all the same stupid ideas with the same stupid spirit speaking to us. We've inherited lies but now God has become my strength and my fortress. I have fortified every area of my life upon his voice, his word, his ways, and his thoughts. When I do, I'll get his actions. And I'll get his results. Oh. Why was the ministry of Jesus exactly three and a half years? Well, Brother Mike, well, there's actually some Hebraic roots people that teach it, wasn't it? It was this one year long. Nah, it was three and a half. Why was it three and a half? The original Torah cycle as given by Moses was three and a half years. It wasn't a year. The year Torah cycle was not, discovered, was not developed until they had developed the synagogues. Nehemiah and Ezra had developed the synagogues while they were in Babylon. Then, because they, they had Torah scrolls and they met each week, they could, they could do it in a one-year cycle. Jesus lived the Torah on how to really live the instruction of God, an entire Torah cycle as God originally gave it. Which also tells us something about the tribulation period. The first three and a half years of the tribulation period are not going to be that bad. Could we be tribulating now? I don't know. That's up to God. But the devil is not going to have twice as much time to do his ministry as Jesus did. He's going to be limited to the three and a half years just like Jesus did. That's why it all turns to hell the last three and a half years. So you really need to take the book of Revelation and look at it not as a seven-year period, but a three and a half-year period. Just throw that out there. But Jesus was our example. When you hear the voice of God... I come to do the will of him who sent me. I don't listen to anybody else. I won't do anything unless he tells me to do it. I won't say anything unless he tells me to say it. When I learn to function like that, I can get the exact same results that Jesus got. If I'm not getting the right results, I've got to look back to see if there's a stronghold speaking to me and it's producing its results and not God's. Because every one of us, guys, look in Ephesians. Paul reminds us, when he hath quickened, uh, he hath, you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, uh, wherein in past times you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Before you got saved, who were you obeying? The devil. I don't care how good you are. You can be, you can be really good as far as what the world considers good, but uh, still miss the mark. Still have the wrong spirit speaking to you. Uh, I, I got to speak to an evangelist here a couple of weeks ago, and he said, I've had to change the way, that, uh, the way that I've preached. And he said, it really has made my church mad. Because he said, I just used to, you know, God just loves you, just come to Jesus. God loves you, come to Jesus. And, and he said, all this greasy grace everybody's preaching, he said, has really affected that, and people aren't responding to the gospel anymore. He said, I have to approach them based upon their sin. Isn't that... <laughs> Going back to the old gospel. And he said, I've walked up to a guy and said, I'm really morally good. Have you ever lied? Yeah, well, then you're a liar. Have you ever stolen anything? I don't care if it's a penny. Just, yeah, well, then you're a thief. And he said, the minute I get them to identify with their sin, they see the need for a Savior. They see the fruit of the prince of the power of the air in their life, and they know somebody needs to deliver them from that Pharaoh. What's God wanting to do? We're entering into a time to actively work with the Holy Spirit to build the fortresses of God within. It's the only thing, guys. Let me me just read some of the phrases that God gave me to see if you can see where I'm coming from. 
God wants to become our fortress. He has to become our fortress, our high tower, and our refuge. Only when we allow his voice to speak into situations in our life and we draw spiritual power from his instruction to establish truth in our minds, our wills, and our emotion that begin to change what we do in the physical world around us. That's living the kingdom. God is instructing us to begin building kingdom fortresses that can withstand the storm that is coming on the world. We're entering in with these fall feasts into a grace period that God is saying, if you'll determine to hear me, I'll show you where all the enemy's high places are in your life so that you can tear them down. If you'll commit to tear them down, he'll show you where they are. And we have a unique window of hearing God's voice more clearly than we've ever had in our lives. God wants us to ask, what vain things have we inherited that do not profit? What vain lies are we living that release dark spiritual power into our lives that always bring defeat? We need to identify those things and overcome them. We must yield to the Holy Spirit school of of life lessons so that we can release new levels of freedom, empowerment, and victory in our lives because it is a time to actively work with the Spirit of God to build fortresses of God within That's where we are prophetically right now. If we can begin doing that, I can begin teaching the rest of what God wants done. I mean, there there has been a lot of things that God has tried to bring that if if, if you don't have this, you can take the promises of God and things like faith and prosperity and all that, and you can have strongholds speak to you as if they're God and get you off. And we've seen a lot of that. Don't throw out the baby with the bath water. There's a reason why the enemy works so hard to get those things off. Or like healing. How many know healing is a good thing? But there are people that went so far in divine healing that they would that it's it's an act of of unbelief to even see a doctor. How I many that's also a good way to just go be with the Lord in some instances. People, people have died over very stupid stuff because there wasn't balance there in listening to the Holy Spirit. Come on, I'm, I'm being truthful. God wants us to walk in a new power of his provision, of his power, of faith, uh, of learning how to, how that if I listen to him, how I can interact with myself within and without to bring the kingdom of God. Because what the devil loves to do and what the devil has reveled in is you're supposed to be walking with God. You're a child of God, but you're still listening to another spirit and you're releasing the kingdom of darkness into your life. The devil loves that more than anything else. If he can get a Christian to speak against what God's doing, he revels in it. I've seen God begin to move in a church. And, all, and half the saints in the town begin to speak against what God's doing because it wasn't their group or it wasn't this or it wasn't that. Or they didn't, they didn't have this brand of piano. Or, I mean, just stupid, stupid stuff. And they end up being an agent of the enemy to tear down what God was doing. There's a book, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, uh, by Watchman E called The Light and Power of the Soul. And he just began to have some real, real turmoil in his life. And he said, God, where's this coming from? He says, it's from prayers of all the Christians that have been convinced to pray against you. He said, they're releasing the power of, Satan is using the power of their soul to come against you. And the minute that he said, now what I want you to do is to bind the soulish power that the enemy's using against you. The moment he began to bind it, all that, st- all that stuff stopped. It's a, it's a charismatic witchcraft prayer. I want my prayers to be spirit-filled with the Spirit of God, not another spirit. I want my words to have the power of God and the resonance of God within them so that God can change not only my situation, but the situations of those around me. I want to get to the place when I walk into a room, I change the atmosphere of that room because I'm so walking with God and He is so speaking to me and I'm thinking His thoughts that that people can sense heaven around me. That's what I want. And God wants to get us there. That's, that's the journey that we're beginning. That's the season we're entering into. Because if you walk in this, guys, you can walk into lack and abundance begins to flow. 
You walk into sickness and it begins to be driven back because of what's working on the inside of you. I'm tired of the wrong stuff being attracted to me. I want it to be repelled by me. Darkness is always repelled by what? Light. Come on. Father, I ask that as we enter into the fall seasons, Father, trumpet starts this next week, and Father, it's a a time of hearkening to the voice of the King. Father, I ask that you would speak to us more clearly than ever. Father, show us where every stronghold is. Show us where every high place the enemy has taken over in our lives are, that we can absolutely tear those things down. And Father, to build an altar there that only you are allowed to speak from, Father. Father, I ask for the grace for all of us to do it. Father, I ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do it. And Father, I ask that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see in this feast time, Lord. Father, I thank you. I praise you. And Father, we come into agreement that the enemy is bound and we command those things be silent in the name of Jesus. And Father, I ask right now that you begin marking them for destruction in our lives. In Jesus' name.